politician G.H. Hardy traveled from Trinity College to Harvard University to deliver a deeply personal account of the Indian genius who became his friend. I have set myself a task in this lecture which is genuinely difficult, almost impossible. I have to try to help you form some sort of reasoned estimate of the most romantic figure in the recent history of mathematics. A man whose career seems full of paradoxes and contradictions, who defies almost all the canons by which we are accustomed to judge one another, and about whom all of us will probably agree in one judgment only, that he was, in some sense, a very great mathematician. I suppose that it is always a little difficult for an Englishman and an Indian to understand one another properly. The real difficulty for me is that Ramanujan was, in a way, my discovery. I did not invent him. Like other great men, he invented himself. But I was the first really competent person who had the chance to see some of his work. And I can still remember with satisfaction that I could recognize at once what a treasure I had found. I owe more to him than to anyone else in the world, with one exception. And my association with him is the one romantic incident in my life. Hardy's association with Ramanujan began with an unexpected letter from Madras. Dear sir, I beg to introduce myself to you as a clerk in the accounts department of the Port Trust Office at Madras on a salary of only 20 pounds per annum. I am now about 23 years of age. I have had no university education but I have undergone the usual school course. After leaving school, I have been employing the spare time at my disposal to work at mathematics. I have made a special study of divergent series in general, and the results I get are termed by the local mathematicians as startling. I would request you to go through the enclosed papers. Being poor, if you are convinced that there is anything of value, I would like to have my theorems published. Being inexperienced, I would very highly value any advice you give me, requesting to be excused from the trouble I give you. I remain, dear sir, yours very sincerely, yes, Ramanujan. Ramanujan had addressed his letter to one of the world's elite academic institutions. Hardy was a fellow of Trinity College. He and J.E. Littlewood, his friend and collaborator, dominated English mathematics in the first half of this century. Bela Bolabash, a Hungarian mathematician and fellow of Trinity, was a good friend of Littlewood in his later years. Littlewood often talked to Bolabash about his close partnership with Hardy and about Ramanujan. The Hardy-Littlewood partnership is probably the greatest scientific partnership ever. And it's rather curious that though they lived in the same college, uh, they actually collaborated by sending each other letters. Uh, they lived only about 50 yards apart, and even then, porters scurried across the court, carrying letters from one to the other. These letters tend to be rather impersonal, all about mathematics, and occasionally some personal details thrown in. Uh, especially at the beginning, they were rather formal. They went like, dear Hardy and uh, dear Littlewood, no Christian names ever. Now, later, they became dear L, dear H, and 20 years on, they almost never wrote and the elocution whatsoever. They just started their mathematics. So they would say, uh, just had an idea for lambda less than one. I should like you to begin by trying to reconstruct the immediate reactions of an ordinary professional mathematician who receives a letter like this from an unknown Hindu clerk. The first question was whether I could recognize anything. Some of the formulae seemed vaguely familiar. I thought that as an expert in definite integrals, I could probably prove a couple of them, and did so, though with a good deal more trouble than I had expected. One or two of the formulae I found much more intriguing, 
and it soon became obvious that Ramanujan must possess much more general theorems and was keeping a great deal up his sleeve. Some of the formulae defeated me completely. I had never seen anything in the least like them before. A single look at them is enough to show that they could only be written down by a mathematician of the highest class. They must be true, because if they were not true, no one would have had the imagination to invent them. Hardy began corresponding with the Indian clerk. He passed Ramanujan's work along to Littlewood, and Littlewood, as usual, responded by letter. I've looked at some of the other results. D is still wrong, of course, and rather a howler. Six is correct up to X to the 33rd. Eight, here is a mild verification. How maddening his letter is in the circumstances. I rather suspect he's afraid that you'll steal his work. Littlewood wrote that uh, my hopes now are that, that he has much important discoveries about continued fractions and elliptic functions. I can believe that he's at least a Jacobi. It's tremendously exciting to find somebody who, who turns up out of the blue and, and who is as good as Jacobi. I mean, that, that's, that's unheard of, of course. It never happened before. It's, it's unimaginable. In fact, in mathematics, almost everybody has a very good teacher. It's, it's very rare to find an outstanding mathematician who was not taught by anybody. Suppose here is the point. We must go along the x-axis, along the y-axis, or along the z-axis, or parallel to them. In this case, by the age of 10, Ramanujan had shown such outstanding mathematical ability that he was awarded the scholarship to the Kumbhakonam Town School. And the Izzard units along the or parallel to the Izzard axis. He had an insatiable curiosity for all things mathematical and neglected his other school subjects. Can be written as a vector sum of three vectors as OP vector. Within a relatively inflexible English based system, he failed to qualify for higher education. MP vector which is the vector sum. We are going to see that this is the resolution, rectangular resolution. At the age of 15, Ramanujan borrowed a copy of Carr's Synopsis of Pure Mathematics, a textbook designed to coach bright English boys for university entrance exams. He worked his way through this book, and its somewhat peculiar style and methods were probably responsible for Ramanujan's odd ways of working, in particular, his apparent disregard of the need for step-by-step -step rigorous proof for his new ideas. Ramanujan to Hardy, 27th February, 1930. I have found in you a friend who views my labors sympathetically. This is already some encouragement to me to proceed with my onward course. You may judge me hard that I am silent on the methods of proof. It is not on account of unwillingness on my part, but because I fear I shall not be able to explain everything in a letter. I do not mean that the methods should be buried with me. It seemed essential to Hardy and Littlewood that Ramanujan be brought to Cambridge, where they could introduce him to modern mathematics and help him develop his true potential. By chance, another Trinity mathematician, E. H. Neville, was going to Madras to give a series of lectures. Hardy asked Neville to contact Ramanujan and invite him to come to England. In Madras, Neville found that Ramanujan was married to a 14-year-old girl called Janaki Amal. She is now 87 and lives in a poor area of Madras surrounded by mementos of her husband. All I can tell you is that day and night he worked on sums. He didn't do anything else. He wasn't interested in anything else, just sums. He wouldn't stop work even to eat. We had to make rice balls for him and place them in the palm of his hand. Isn't that extraordinary? Neville found that there were certain very real obstacles to Hardy's plan. The transition of India of the late 19th, early 20th century 
was one in which one transferred one's interest from education in uh, Tamil literature or in Sanskrit literature and conforming to the religious practices and then changing over to uh, reading uh, English history uh, and science and ambitions in science. I mean, they provided an element of conflict. I think the way to understand Ramanujan is, on the one hand, he was driven by an ambition, a desire to promote his mathematical abilities, and at the same time, tied to a social background which he felt he had to conform. Ramanujan and his family were Brahmins, poor but extremely orthodox in matters of religious observance. Ramanujan's mother was strongly opposed to his leaving India. She believed that by crossing the seas to another land, a Brahmin is polluted and loses caste. According to Ramanujan's Indian biographers, his mother agreed to the trip after she had a dream in which the goddess Namagiri commanded her to let her son go. But Ramanujan's widow remembers the incident differently. His family told him not to go, and at first he agreed not to. But then he said he was going to Namakal to ask the goddess Namagiri for guidance. She told him to go. Yes, and now I remember. I asked if I could go with him, but he told me I was too young. Ramanujan to Hardy, 22nd January 1914. Dear Sir, I learned from your letter and Mr. Neville that you are anxious to get me to Cambridge. I went to Mr. Neville of your college, who very kindly spoke to me and cleared my doubts that I need not care for my expenses, that my English will do, that I am not asked to go to England to appear for any examination, and that I can remain a vegetarian there. So I request that you and Mr. Littlewood will be good enough to take the trouble of getting me there within a very few months. You are sincerely, yes, Ramanujan. Before he left for London, he had his hair long, and because he thought it would hurt our feelings, he sent us off to Kopagonam. Then he cut his hair and dressed in different clothes. You can see the photo of how he looked. I myself never saw him like that. I only saw the photo. He didn't like to have his photo taken. Dear Mr. Krishna Rao, reached Suez this evening. For the first three days, I was very uncomfortable and took very little food, and after that, I have been all right. The sea is very smooth, and there is no fear of seasickness. I do not know whether I shall have to go to Cambridge directly or stay at London and then go. I shall write to you after I reach England and everything is definitely settled. My best compliments to your brother and warmest thanks to your uncle. was about to enter a world he could not possibly have imagined from 6,000 miles away in Madras. When I first uh, joined Trinity, fellowship at Trinity was the height of ambition. We were really a band of very excellent people in their particular subjects and the rubbing off of one against the other, I think did have a very salutary effect. We were odd, I have no doubt, 
We had been odder in days gone by when none of us were married. When I joined the fellowship, at least half the fellows were married and lived out of college, didn't live on top of each other as they used to. He came, I suspect, from a very poor environment. Madras is better than most cities in India. It's infinitely better than Bombay and Calcutta. But <coughs> it was a poor community. And to come to the highly privileged conditions which still existed in 1914 in this place, must have been a very great uh, strain on him. My dear Krishna Rao, please excuse me for the long delay in writing to you. Now I am somewhat accustomed to the living here. Till now, I did not feel comfortable and I would often think, why had I come here? It is due to the difficulty of getting proper food had it not been for the good milk and fruits here, I would have suffered more. Mr. Hardy, Mr. Neville and others here are very unassuming, kind and obliging. As for my food, I have no other go but to cook myself. There is no place very near this college where I can get vegetarian food. I'll be very much obliged if you can send me some tamarind and good coconut oil by postal parcel through the cheapest route. It was not merely that he wanted to be a vegetarian, but he presumably felt compelled that the food should not be in any way made or produced by foreigners or cooked in vessels in which meat might have been cooked. And if he felt constrained to, to be restricted in that way, then of course he had to cook his own food. On the other hand, I mean, he was so involved in mathematics that uh, I remember that Professor Anandarao, who was a contemporary of uh, Ramanujan in Cambridge, said that he made his meals at extremely odd times because he was so occupied with his work. From the Hindu newspaper, 13th May, 1914, Mr. S. Ramanujan of Madras, whose work in higher mathematics has excited the wonder of Cambridge, is now in residence at Trinity. He will read mainly with the two fellows of the college, Mr. Hardy and Mr. Littlewood. They are going through masses of work he has already done and are making some surprising discoveries in it. Ramanujan, Hardy, and Littlewood have to be imagined as explorers in an exotic landscape of mathematical patterns, harmony, and surprising interconnections. This landscape was their natural habitat, although to the uninitiated, it may seem completely impossible to fathom. In 1940, Hardy wrote an elegant account of his own passion for what he called the real mathematics. Pure mathematics seems to me to be a rock on which all idealism founders. 317 is a prime, not because we think so, or because our minds are shaped in one way rather than another, but because it is so, because mathematical reality is built that way. I cannot remember ever having wanted to be anything but a mathematician. I suppose that it was always clear that my specific abilities lay that way, and it never occurred to me to question the verdict of my elders. I do not remember having felt, as a boy, any passion for mathematics, and such notions as I may have had of the career of a mathematician were far from noble. I thought of mathematics in terms of examinations and scholarships. I wanted to beat other boys, and this seemed to be the way in which I could do so most decisively. I knew Hardy, I won't say well, I knew certain aspects of Hardy quite well as I'd been with him quite a long time. I did not know 
Littlewood. <laughs> Littlewood. <laughs> the idea was that Littlewood had been invented by Hardy to account for any possible mistakes there might have been in Littlewood and Hardy. But I think he actually was a real character. I saw a good deal more, and I was more temperamentally well disposed to Hardy than I was to Littlewood. When I knew Hardy, he was already getting on in age, and I think he had shrunk in his frame. He, to my mind, he was a small man and wiry, tense, like an acrobat, always casting himself in the role of the next move, wanting to uh, <laughs> pit himself against the obstacle. If intellectual curiosity, professional pride and ambition are the dominant incentives to research, then assuredly no one has a fairer chance of gratifying them than a mathematician. His subject is the most curious of all. There is none in which truth plays such odd pranks. It has the most elaborate and the most fascinating technique and gives unrivaled openings for the display of sheer technical skill. Finally, as history proves abundantly, mathematical achievement, whatever its intrinsic worth, is the most enduring of all. A mathematician, like a painter or a poet, is a maker of patterns. If his patterns are more permanent than theirs, it is because they are made with ideas. A painter makes patterns with shapes and colors, a poet with words. The mathematician patterns, like the painter or the poets, must be beautiful. The ideas, like the colors or the words, must fit together in a harmonious way. Beauty is the first test. There is no permanent place in the world for ugly mathematics. As most of you know, this passage is from Hardy, from his Apology. In emphasizing the importance of beauty in mathematics, Hardy must have been influenced by his association with Ramanujan, the subject of this talk, because Hardy found Ramanujan's results particularly There was one difficult. great puzzle. What was to be done in the way of teaching him modern mathematics? The limitations of his knowledge were as startling as its profundity. Here was a man who could work out modular equations and theorems of complex multiplication to orders unheard of, whose mastery of continued fractions was, on the formal side at any rate, beyond that of any mathematician in the world. And yet he had never heard of a double periodic function or of Cauchy's theorem, and had indeed but the vaguest idea of what a function of a complex variable was. This is by five for every value of n. Okay, I think this will be the very last thing I will, I will prove, but, but we, sh we should prove something. So let's, let's try to see how, how Ramanujan did it. And actually we can do exactly the proof he gave. His ideas of what constitutes a mathematical proof were of the most shadowy description. All his results, new or old, right or wrong, had been arrived at by a process of mingled argument, intuition and induction of which he was entirely unable to give any coherent account. It was impossible to ask such a man to submit to systematic instruction, to try to learn mathematics from the beginning once more. I was afraid, too, that if I insisted unduly on matters which Ramanujan found irksome, I might destroy his confidence or break the spell of his inspiration. So I had to try to teach him. And in a measure, I succeeded though obviously I learned from him much more than he learned from me. My dear Krishna Rao, I am very slowly publishing my results. The other professors here whom I know have lost their interest in mathematics owing to the present war. One of the professors here some days back remarked that I have come to England in the most unfortunate time. Hardy to the University of Madras, 11th of November, 1915. Ramanujan has been much handicapped by the war. Mr. Littlewood, who would naturally have shared his teaching with me, has been away 
and one teacher is not enough for so fertile a pupil. Cambridge had been transformed. Trinity College was turned into a military training camp and temporary hospital for the wounded. Ramanujan to his mother, September 11th, 1915. Ramanujan makes his countless prostrations to his mother. Please write about your welfare. There is no war in this country. War is going on only in the neighboring country. That is to say, war is waged in a country that is as far as Rangoon is from Madras. No war like this has raged before. The present war affects millions of people. Germans set fire to many a city, slaughter and throw away all the people, the children, the women and the world. When the world is mad, a mathematician may find in mathematics an incomparable anodyne. For mathematics is, of all the arts and sciences, the most austere and the most remote. A mathematician should be, of all men, the one who can most easily take refuge where, as Bertrand Russell says, one at least of our nobler impulses can best escape from the dreary exile of the actual world. When Littlewood returned to Cambridge on leave from ballistics research, he was fascinated by what Ramanujan had been doing in his absence. Littlewood later wrote, There was hardly a field of formulae that Ramanujan had not enriched, in which he had not revealed unsuspected possibilities. The beauty and singularity of his results was entirely uncanny. 2 pi square root 2, sum from q goes from 1 to nu, square root q, one was impressed by his extraordinary profusion, variety and power. The story of one particular result of Ramanujan's, the formula for the number of partitions of n, is a romantic one, but it resulted in a very astonishing theorem. When we think of partitioning a number, what we are talking about is breaking it up into a sum of other numbers. For example, uh, 10 is 6 plus 4. In additive number theory, one wishes to look at all possible ways of doing this. So, for example, if we think of a small number like 4, there are five possible ways of doing it. 4 can be written as 4 itself, a single term sum. 3 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 1 plus 1, and a sum of four ones. There are five ways of doing it. As soon as you look at even slightly larger numbers, there become many more ways of doing this. Take, for example, the number 7. If we look at 7, there are 15 ways of writing 7 as sums of numbers. 7 itself, 6 plus 1, 5 plus 2, 5 plus 1 plus 1, 4 plus 3, four plus two plus and one. seven ones. So if we count up all the sums that we've made here, we see that the total number is 15. And generally this is denoted by the shorthand P of seven equals 15. Ramanujan and Hardy wanted to develop a formula to calculate the partitions of any number, no matter how large. At that time, at around the turn of the century, one of the great mathematical achievements was what was called the prime number theorem. And this theorem gave a formula for approximating how many primes there were to any particular number you wanted. Primes are numbers like 3 or 11, which can't be divided by any other number. The theorem tells roughly how many primes there are below 100 or 1 billion or any number. Although it was a tremendous achievement, indeed a brilliant piece of work, 
it is an approximate solution. Consequently, when people started studying the number of partitions of an integer, so to speak, the basic problem of addition, as studying primes as the basic problem of multiplication, the hope was that you could find a formula for this number, which would be as good as this major achievement in prime number theory. Consequently, say, if you were counting the number of partitions of 200, which turned out to be around 4 trillion, you would expect that an error around a million or so would be excellent. You would probably be pleased if it was on the order of only billions, uh, but you might hope for millions. Ramanujan believed, however, that all of this was lowering your sights much too much. He believed that it would be possible to provide a formula that would be exactly correct. Hardy was skeptical. He thought finding an approximate formula was the best they could do. The two of them together were able to produce this formula, which they then checked against the number of ways of partitioning 200. The right answer is close to 4 trillion. They had the Major McMahon compute by hand the correct answer, which took nearly a month of time prior to high-speed computers. And when they compared their predicted answer to his, they found that their theoretical calculations came to within 0 .004 of the exactly correct answer. Well, since the answer is a whole number and not a fraction, all you need to do is take their theoretical answer, drop off the fractional part, and you have the exact right answer. And this was a revolutionary and surprising achievement. The form of this formula is even more stunning. It involves transcendental numbers and expressions that seem to be totally unrelated. They might be appropriate, say, in a course on engineering or theoretical physics, but for actually counting how many ways you can add up sums to get a particular number, they seem absolutely incredible. In fact, I was stunned the first time I saw this formula. I could not believe it. And the experience of seeing it explained and understanding how it took shape uh, really, I think, convinced me that this was the area of mathematics I wanted to pursue. Q e to the minus 2 and I'm sure even if now you, you asked 99.9% .9 of, the, of the mathematicians whether they would like to prove such a result, if they do not know that, that it actually had been done by Hardy and Ramanujan, I suspect they would say that Oh, this, this, this is just answer the question. There's no way one can write down uh, s such a sum of products of complicated terms that actually gives you the exact value. Now, it was entirely up to Ramanujan to get it right. And then Hardy brought in all the technical skill, and he was a wonderful mathematician, and he, he could overcome the technical difficulties. But I believe uh, Hardy was not the only mathematician who could have overcome those difficulties. I'm sure that Littlewood could have done it, probably Mordor could have done it, Boya could have done it. I'm sure there are quite a few people who could have played Hardy's role. But Ramanujan's role in that particular partnership, I don't think could have been played at the time by anybody else. <laughs> The origins of Ramanujan's extraordinary mathematical insight remain a mystery. What did he really mean when he told Indian friends that his formulas were revealed to him in his sleep by the goddess Namagiri? Hardy and most other pure mathematicians will acknowledge that there are these flashes of insight, that mathematics is not a, a game in which you sit just writing and writing and writing and things sort of slowly evolve in a deductive science, as many people believe. It is something where you try a problem, you fail, you try something else, you fail, you give up for a while, and one morning when you're standing in the shower, all of a sudden it hits you. This is how the thing goes, and this flash of insight 
sort of describes the whole panorama for you and then you go to your study and you start to write and you see clearly what was correct and you're able to write down a full justification of your insight. Well, if one suggests that, that say, Ramanujan, being the genius he was, had more of this happen to him more often than the average mathematician, and he had it happen with his outlook, Hindu outlook, it is not inconceivable that he would attach a religious significance to it. I do not believe in the immemorial wisdom of the East. And the picture I want to present to you is that of a man who had his peculiarities like any other distinguished man, but a man in whose society one could take pleasure, with whom one could take tea and discuss politics or mathematics. The picture, in short, not of a wonder from the East or an inspired idiot or a psychological freak, but of a rational human being who happened to be a great mathematician. There's no way even Hardy could see what went on in Ramanujan's mind. Um, he came up with, these, uh, with his amazing formulae, amazing relations and identities, and then he had these fantastic hunches, but I don't think uh, Hardy could ever know how uh, Ramanujan came to have these, uh, these, these hunches, how he came to have such well-informed guesses occasionally. Of course, in other cases, Ramanujan uh, was absolutely wrong. He was very naive. I mean, he, he thought that mathematics is, um, is, is very nice. There are very few pitfalls. Uh, that, that was one of his strengths and also uh, one, one of his weaknesses. But he didn't realize that things could go very badly wrong. In the spring of 1917, Ramanujan fell ill, possibly with tuberculosis, a gastric ulcer, or perhaps a severe vitamin deficiency caused by poor nutrition. No one was able to make a precise diagnosis. Ramanujan was ill essentially all the time. He was in, in, in and out of bed. Uh, one thing ached or the other thing ached. Um, uh, he, he went through a host of doctors. And whenever he started with the doctor, he was full of confidence, faith and hope. And unfortunately, a little later, when he realized the doctor couldn't help him, he, he went to the other extreme and he saw that this doctor was no good at all. I fell into his trap. How, could, how can I get away from him? How can I run away from him? My dear Ramalingam, the whole of last night I had fever and my temperature this morning was about 102 degrees. The old cook has left this place the day before yesterday. The present cook spoiled all the appalappu by scorching some of them and leaving some raw. Yesterday, I had no dinner at all. My dear Ramanujan, I was exceedingly grieved to have your painful letter. Sorry to hear the new cook is a failure as far as you are concerned. Now then, I will have to be a bit harsh with you. I am impressed with your being so particular about your palate but you'll have to choose between controlling your palate and killing yourself. Hardy to the Master of Trinity, February 1918. Dear Thompson, I should like to say more clearly what the position about Ramanujan is. If he had not been so ill, I would have deferred putting him up for a fellowship for a year or so. Not that there is any question of the strength of his claim, but merely to let things take their ordinary course. As it is, I felt no time must be lost. For my own part, I think probably he will be alive in a year's time and that he may recover completely. Like all Indians, he is fatalistic and it is terribly hard to get him to take care of himself. Everyone, too, is frightened of the continual illness and solitude affecting his mind. In various sanatoria he was in, the pain he had and, and the mathematics he was trying to do and was enjoying completely dominated his life. In fact, at, at some stage, he actually had nightmares. He had nightmares in which he viewed his own abdomen and he saw it as uh, a function which had various singularities. 
and this function has singularities at one and at minus one and lots of other in integers and he had a very strong pain at one and he had uh, half as much pain at singularity minus one and he had third as much pain on the outside and so on so he just viewed his own stomach as a mathematical object he viewed his own abdomen as a mathematical math mathematical object and uh, such nightmares apparently recurred so he must have been completely preoccupied with his illness and mathematics Ramanujan's condition and state of mind fluctuated wildly. He even attempted suicide. No one can understand Ramanujan who does not understand his passion for numbers in themselves. He could remember the idiosyncrasies of numbers in an almost uncanny way. It was Littlewood who said that every positive integer was one of Ramanujan's friends. I remember going to see him when he was lying ill in Putney. I had ridden in taxicab number 1729 and remarked that the number seemed to me rather a dull one and that I hoped it was not an unfavorable omen. No, he replied, it is a very interesting number. It is the smallest number expressible as a sum of two cubes in two different ways. With the end of the war, Ramanujan decided to go back to India, at least for a while. The work he had already done in England had secured him fellowships at both the Royal Society and Trinity, the first Indian to be elected to either. I, Srinivasa Ramanujan, elected fellow of Trinity College, do hereby promise that I will loyally observe the statutes, ordinances, and good customs of the college, and in all things endeavor to promote its welfare. 22nd February, 1919. Yes, Ramanujan. Five days later, he left for India. He would never see Trinity College again. He will return to India with a scientific standing and reputation such as no Indian has enjoyed before and I'm confident that India will regard him as the treasure he is. His natural simplicity and modesty has never been affected in the least by success. Indeed, all that is wanted is to get him to realize that he really is a success. He used to say, if you had come with me, I wouldn't have fallen ill. It's because you didn't come that my health failed. Ramanujan's last year must have been uh, a very hard one for him. One of Ramanujan's classmates met him on his return to Madras and writes that he was very strained. He was not a very happy person the way he was before he left India. And he says that he looked very glum and very morose. He said he had left all his maths books in England and would like to go back. He also said he had 5,000 rupees in savings to buy me diamond eardrops and a gold belt. But in some strange way, Ramanujan must have felt that uh, his life was coming to an end, of course, as I'm guessing, because the speed with which he did work during the past year, and which has been recorded in what is now called the Lost Notebook, is... Uh, according to everyone who has read it, one of the most uh, original pieces of mathematics, and in some ways, the very best which Ramanujan did. Ramanujan to Hardy, Madras, 12th January, 1920. I'm extremely sorry for not writing you a single letter up to now. I have discovered very interesting functions recently which I call mob theta functions. Unlike the false theta functions, they enter into mathematics as beautifully as the ordinary theta functions. He wouldn't talk to anyone who came to the house. It was always maths. Even then he didn't care about his meals, but would only do sums. He sent them to England. Four days before he died, he was scribbling. He filled a box with papers, and there were more papers scattered around the bed. 
The peoples went here and there and changed hands. I don't know where they went. For him, in this universe, maths was everything. The work Ramanujan did on his deathbed disappeared from the world of mathematics for 50 years. Somehow, the papers must have found their way to Cambridge, but whoever got them never published anything about them. In 1968, several boxes from the estate of another Cambridge mathematician were deposited at the Trinity College Library. Eight years later, Professor Andrews asked to see those boxes for some routine research he was doing. It was a fantastic moment because I had gone to the Trinity College Library without the least idea in mind that I would see anything of significance, real significance. I expected to see nothing of Ramanujan's, and yet here was one box with a number of things from Ramanujan cataloged in a little sheet to go with the box, including this one large manuscript. And of course, that immediately interested me because I'd never heard of it before. It, no one had ever mentioned it that I knew of in the literature or anywhere else. So I started to look through that, and after looking at a few pages, I saw what Ramanujan had called mock theta functions, and that was an extremely uh, exciting moment because in three months before Ramanujan died, he wrote a letter to Hardy back from India in which he said, I have discovered some very interesting functions recently, which I call mock theta functions. And so you could say immediately, this is something of immense significance. So uh, I, <laughs> I was thrilled by it. In studying his work, one of the things that is most disturbing is that I do not feel I can understand how he came up with these ideas. With most of my contemporaries who, who are doing work related to mine so that I can see what they do, I may admire their achievements, or I may say, why didn't I think of that? But I can, I think, piece together what their motivation was, their thought process, as they came up with these results. I don't see their thinking as that much different from mine. But in studying this notebook, this manuscript that he prepared in this last year of his life, and having, having studied it intensively for 10 years, I don't feel that I have grasped his mind as a mathematician at all. Ramanujan was always guided by example. He would run many calculations. Indeed, in this lost notebook, probably almost half of it consists of pages that have a certain uh, almost hysteria about them. Uh, formulas are sort of started and stopped, tailing off in one direction. A column of figures will be added up at an angle over here. Something else will be written upside down. Nothing will be comprehensible on such a page. So you get a clear feeling that he is working from example and building this up from uh, uh, smaller ideas into one of these grand formulas. Of the discoveries in this notebook, I would say that prior to actually unearthing the notebook itself and seeing what was there, maybe 15 or 20 percent of these formulas had been discovered in some way or another by others. But the vast majority of it is not only lay undiscovered, but contains treasures of interest and significance in mathematics today. So although one can feel tremendous sympathy for this man as he was dying, nonetheless, what he did was absolutely marvelous. On his deathbed, he told me that his name would live for a hundred years. He said, whether I am alive or dead, you will have money. He knew he was dying and said there was nothing anyone could do about it. I always remember his name whenever I meditate.
I have just heard from India that Ramanujan is dead. It is a great shock to me, for I thought before he went back that he had begun to turn the corner. Could not Trinity do something to commemorate him permanently in a small way? After all, he was a most extraordinary genius, of whom even Trinity may be justly proud. Hardy has a plaque in the Bowling Green, and Littlewood's bust stands in the elegant room to which Trinity Fellows still retire after dinner to drink claret and port. There is no plaque or bust of Ramanujan at Trinity. But Hardy did help arrange for Ramanujan's mathematical papers to be edited and published as a lasting memorial to his mathematical genius. Even when Hardy informed Littlewood of, of Ramanujan's death, uh, and little would answer hardly from Cornwall, where he was at the time. Uh, most of the letter was about mathematics. The letter started off saying, Dear H, what a tragedy about R. I will see what I can do about the obituaries. And then number one, Omega H. You are proof of the lemma about sigma from minus n to infinity minus one to the n, and the minus s is sound. More or less really In 1941, a picture post photographer took this photo of an unnamed spectator at a Twickenham rugby match. It was G.H. Hardy. A year earlier, when he felt he was past his prime, Hardy wrote these words in his mathematician's apology. I have never done anything useful. No discovery of mine has made, or is likely to make, directly or indirectly, for good or for ill, the least difference to the amenity of the world. Judged by all practical standards, the value of my mathematical life is nil. And outside mathematics, it is trivial anyhow. The case for my life then, or for anyone else who has been a mathematician in the same sense in which I have been one, is this. That I have added something to knowledge, and helped others to add more. And that these somethings have a value which differs in degree only, and not in kind, from that of the creations of the great mathematicians, or of any of the other artists, great or small, who have left some kind of memorial behind them. I still say to myself when I'm depressed and find myself forced to listen to pompous and tiresome people, well, I have done one thing you could never have done, and that is to have collaborated with both Littlewood and Ramanujan on something like equal terms. Coming up, the earthquake is coming, but is the nation prepared to handle the devastation of a major quake in California? Join Frontline for a startling report next on 12. Then at 9, discover how T.S. Eliot became the most influential poet of his generation on voices and visions. A transcript of this program send four dollars to Nova, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Please be sure to include the show title. Major funding for Nova is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by Allied Signal, a technology leader in aerospace, electronics, automotive products, and engineered materials. and by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide.
Next on Nova, a breakthrough in a little known field could revolutionize the way we use energy. It's an opportunity that maybe comes around once in every scientist's career or never comes around in your career. It's, and to be in the right place at the right time, it made me want to go for it. At a time when the U.S. is losing technological ground to Japan, the stakes are high. The race for the superconductor. That's next time on Nova. Most Nova programs are available on video cassette for educational use. For information, call 1-800-621-2131. In Illinois or Alaska, call Collect, 312-940-1260. Nova on Channel 12 is made possible in part with grants provided by the Cabot Corporation in Tuscola and the affiliates in oral and maxillofacial surgery. With offices in Champaign, Bloomington, Mattoon, and Normal, the affiliates provide specialized care in oral diagnosis, office surgery, general anesthesia, and major oral and maxillofacial surgery. Additional funding is provided by neighborhood Hooks Drug Stores, serving home and health care needs. Hooks is proud to underwrite NOVA and invites you to join in supporting public television in central Illinois. Hi, I'm Thomas Gubeck. Spencer Tracy and Deborah Carr are a British couple who discover they drove their son to suicide in Edward, My Son, on silver screen tonight at 10.30. Venture into one of the harshest environments on Earth, the forbidden desert of the Danakil, a new survival special. The sun is bouncing off the gritty lava debris at over 120 degrees. These three tribesmen have walked many miles for one reason only. The best reason for doing anything in the Danakil, to find water. Retrace the steps of explorer Wilfred Thesiger as he recalls his encounters with the savage tribesmen of this barren and desolate landscape. Trek through the forbidden desert of the Danakil, Wednesday night at 7, 